Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this Early Childhood Public Lecture, the sixth in the series organized by SUSS. My name is Sam Chiwa. I'm an associate professor from the SR Naden School of Human Development, and I will be your host today. Today, we have four researchers from the newly set up Center for Research in Early Childhood Education, or in short, CRECE of Macquarie University, Australia. And before I introduce the speakers, please allow me to say a few words about CRECE. This center carries out research based on two themes. The first is on impactful individualized early childhood pedagogies. And the second is on knowledgeable, supported early childhood educators and families. The purpose is twofold, to generate new knowledge about how to enhance the learning of all children from birth to five, and to investigate workforce factors that increase educator capabilities, resilience, and also support family partnerships. It's our privilege to have four speakers from CRECE today. They are Professor Sheila Degotadi, Dr. Fiona Zheng, Dr. Natalie Bren, and Dr. Emilia Jonov. Please join me in welcoming all our speakers. Thank you so much for this lovely <laughs> Well, as before, um, the speakers will present first and we'll leave the last 15 to 20 minutes for Q&A. And um, Dr. Emilia Jonov, who is a senior lecturer and researcher at CRECE, will introduce her talk and her colleagues. So over to you, Amelia. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so should I start sharing now or do you need to start yes, sharing? Yes, please do. Okay. <laughs> Thank you so much for the invitation to present at the Early Childhood Education and Care Public Lecture Series for um, Singapore University of Social Sciences. We are very pleased um, uh, to be able to accept it and also to represent, we're very honoured to represent our Centre for Research in Early Childhood Education today. Our focus in today's presentation will be on the language environment of infants and toddlers in early childhood education settings and its value for learning. And so in our presentation, there's four of us. I'll be the MC, so I'll be um, doing some segues, uh, but also Professor Sheila de Gutardi, who is leading the presentation and also who is the director of CRIS of our Centre for Research in Early Childhood Education. She unfortunately is unable to join us um, synchronously, but what she has done for us is to record her main part of the presentation and also to record some of the transitions very kindly, some of the transitions between the different presentations. So you'll be able to hear her voice and when I'm uh, playing her parts, I'll uh, change my video to her image. So don't be confused. That's why you can see two names on my um, login details. So the four of us represent an important strand of research at the center and this in our research we focus on language in infant toddler pedagogy and practice and Dr. Fiona Zhang and Dr. Natalie Brandt um, are also some of our early career researchers and doing really exciting research that uh, Professor Shirley Dukutati and I have had um, the um, honor uh, to learn from and um, supervise. Um, and yeah, Dr. Fiona Zhang is doing her second PhD. She's one of those very rare people uh, who um, is keen to continue. So we're all involved in two projects that I hope to say a few words um, about right at the end, which are called MQ Talk and MQ Toddler Talk. And they both focus on the kind of language environment and language um, skills that um, infants and toddlers need uh, to be able to then um, use language for learning and uh, achieve better academic um, and also language outcomes later on. So that's Sheila de Gutardi. Thanks, Amelia. So it's my pleasure to provide a brief introduction to our presentation today. And I want to start with this quote. 
As names have power, words have power. Words can light fires in the minds of men. And I particularly like this quote because it highlights to us the importance of language in human existence and in human life. Words absolutely do have power. The way in which we use words, the words that we hear, they construct our identity. But more importantly, as it says in this quote, they light fires in our minds. They stimulate our curiosity. They help us to build understandings and build the knowledge that we then take with us. So in this presentation, we're going to um, unpack some of these ideas. But let me start with unpacking a little bit more about why words are so powerful. So let's start by thinking, why are words so powerful? To begin with, we've got a wealth of knowledge now that demonstrate that children's early language development is foundational for later literacy. So the competence that children develop in those first few years of life are able to predict not only how they um, learn language, but also their literacy skills and their learning in general, their academic outcomes. So in other words, children who can express their ideas clearly and confidently become better readers, better writers and better speakers as they get older and progress to school. They learn a love for words and words become a source of information and a way that they can share their ideas and knowledge and opinions with others. But words also have power for another reason. Infants who grow up in and experience a language rich environment are likely to develop better language skills than those who do not have such language rich experiences. So what do I mean by language rich environments? I mean environments where infants and toddlers experience a lot of talk in the context of meaningful and responsive social interaction. There now exists a wealth of research that demonstrates that both the quantity of talk that children experience and the qualities of that talk and the qualities of the interactions that they participate in make a real difference to their language development. So all of these things combined create that language rich environment. So let me start just with a couple of examples. Here's little Ethan, who is on the mat and he's engrossed in the various toys that have been scattered around. Ethan holds his cup carefully in his hands and rotates it. He looks up at a nearby educator who looks at him and smiles and nods and says, wow. Ethan then returns to his exploration. Here's another example. Louis and Mia are sitting with their educator they're both engrossed with plastic cylinders and Louis looks up at the educator who says, can you put the green one on the top? Louis places it carefully and the educator responds with a, that's the way, it's a bit tricky, isn't it? And Mia watches on with interest. Now, what is the difference between these two examples? The example of Ethan shows a child who is very much engrossed in what he's doing and an educator who's attentively watching on but there is a difference between that example and the example with, Le with Louis and Mia. What the educator is doing with Louis and Mia is what Hirsch Pasek and Galinkoff have referred to as languagizing their, word, their world. In other words, what the educator is doing is surrounding the child's play with interesting uh, comments about what they're doing, with the uh, invitation to interact and also verbalize. So what is she doing? She's creating that language rich environment. So those children are being surrounded by language in everything that they do. And why is this important? Apart from the developmental reason why these things are important, we also need to recognize in particular um, in, in the context of um, early childhood education and care in Australia, that 
the importance of learning through interactions is written into our core early learning framework. So here are some examples. The first one says that learning occurs in social contexts and that interactions and conversations are vitally important for learning. In other words, they're not just important for language development, but they're important tool for learning for the child um, themselves. There's another one here about learning being co-constructed through interactions between the child and the educator. In other words, language doesn't happen purely by chance. Language doesn't happen purely because the child hears lots of language from the educator, but language development happens when the child as well as the educator have the opportunity to participate in these interactions. And the final one is that learning and language development happens when children are engaged in sustained shared conversations that extend their thinking. And again, there we have the link between language as a tool for learning language, but also as a tool for thinking. Language provides children with the opportunity to build concepts and extend their thinking that we wouldn't be able to provide if we didn't surround those children with language. So in summary, what we need to look at in the early childhood context is look closely at the interactions that are happening between educators and infants and think about how are those uh, interactions not only stimulating language, but also stimulating learning. Because then what we'll see are elements of this rich uh, language and learning environment that the ultimate aim of which is to provide competent communicators and learners. So I'm going to leave it there now and leave it with Amelia, who's going to take it further. Okay, so some of the key Sorry, some of the key messages are very well captured, I feel, in this um, quote by Mernane, Sawhill and Snow, who focused on preschool children and noted that children from families with more financial and cultural resources differ from their less advantaged peers in access to knowledge about topics, various topics related to the natural world, bugs, flowers, tidal pools and so on, astronomy, current events and so on, and that these differences in children's knowledge were indexed by enormous social class differences in their language, in their vocabulary, and they are produced by differences than differential access to oral language interactions. Um, which, you know, of course, also oral language interactions would relate also to access to resources that can support such rich oral language interactions, for example, uh, books read aloud and so on, both in the home and in the early childcare settings. So what we're really focusing on here is to pay attention not only to the home environments and differences there, but also to think about differences that children may be experiencing, infants and toddlers may be experiencing in their early childhood settings. And so just to summarize, linguistic interactions promote learning because they allow children to share and or extend their knowledge, that differences in language outcomes and knowledge are index differences that you know in terms of the access to language rich environments and this is why access to language rich environments is an important social justice issue that we need to consider so we need to look at whether all children have access to the same kind of language environments in their early childhood settings now we know from previous studies that language learning in infancy has long lasting effects on learning and we know from studies such as Hart and Risley's um, study, for example, or Erica Hoff's work and Kutten Locker et al, that both the quantity and the quality of adult talk with infants predict the language outcomes that they have and provide the context for language development as well as learning more broadly. So the language environment is important, but most of the research has focused on the language environment children have at home. Um, we also have more recent studies that similarly show us that vocabulary, for example, at 19 months predicts children's reading comprehension at 12 years of age. The children's early learning oriented talk predicts their academic language proficiency in mid-adolescence 
um, Uccelli et al. 2018. And also more recently, when uh, researchers have turned their uh, eyes to infants and toddlers in early childhood settings. And so Gilkerson et al., for example, show that both adult word count and conversational turns that are experienced by 18 to 24 month old infants predict cognitive and language outcomes at 10 to 12 years of age. So what we're going to focus on um, is to present uh, some of our work here that focuses on language environments in early childhood settings, focusing on the quantity initially, but then also turning to consider in more detail the quality of that talk and its pot potential to promote a language for learning in infants and toddlers. So first we uh, have a presentation by Dr. Fiona Cheng on multilingual infants language experiences in early childhood centres. Then Professor Sheila de Gutardi will talk about educator infant conversations. And finally, we have a presentation by Dr. Natalie Brandt, who will talk about toddlers learning through toddler educator conversations, looking even more closely at the language features and the purpose of these conversations and how they can promote learning. So moving on to Fiona. Thank you, Amelia and Sheila, for sharing with us how important the language environment for young children's uh, language learning. So today, I would like to share you some findings regarding other studies on uh, whether multilingualism matters in infants' language environments. Evidence for Australia Early Childhood Education Centers. As you may know, similar to Singapore, Australia is a very uh, diverse multicultural society. Therefore, we have uh, many multilingual infants attending early childhood centers. It's important to understand what uh, these infants experience in early childhood language environments. As you may know, there are many differences in language environments between the monolingual infant and multilingual infants. For example, how they learn uh, to pronounce the first sound, uh, how they learn a new vocabulary, uh, and the acquisition of grammar. Therefore, we would like to note whether this difference also can be found in um, early childhood language environments. So currently, it's uh, previous studies on multilingual infants are mainly focused on their home language environments. Um, but there's a few studies shows that there are many differences in their language environment in early childhood settings uh, for preschool age children. For example, Chen studies uh, find that uh, the in UK, the multilingual preschool age children, they hear uh, less complicated vocabulary or sentence from the teachers. And for example, Wood studies here um, report that uh, in the United States, the um, Spanish and English multilingual preschool age children, uh, actually they hear less input from the uh, adults, also, they vocalize less than their monolingual peers. So, therefore, there's no research has been examining the difference between the monolingual and multilingual infants' language environment in early childhood settings. We would like to know the quality and the quantity of their language environments in early childhood centers. So, how can we measure the quality and the quantity of the language environment? in early childhood centers for these infants. Uh, one of the useful tools is the NINA technology. As you can see it in this picture, um, the child will wearing a vest at the beginning of the day. And in front of the vest, there's a pocket that can put the NINA device. This device can uh, record all the audio recordings from the, the adult speech, uh, child speech, um, so this uh, Nina software be able to uh, use some algorithm to identify uh, the adult speech, child speech, or the other noise, and they be able to uh, generalize the estimate number of the adult word count 
which form educators in the centers, uh, the infant vocalization, child vocalization count, and the infant educators conversation terms. Moving forward, so with all these uh, outcome of the uh, language environments, we will also want to know what kind of uh, factors, variables uh, can predict the variations. As we mentioned before, they maybe have a huge difference among all these infants' language environment. So what factors predict the variations among these infants' language environments? So first, we would like to consider the uh, early childhood characteristics. It includes group size, educator infant ratio, and educator qualifications, which means whether the educator has a bachelor degree or not. The next factors we would like to focus is the infant characteristics, which include the infant age, infant gender, and the current language environment is measured by the parents. They will uh, assess their child's language skills, use a questionnaire from the uh, Nina software as well. So they got this score to reflect their current language skill. The duration of the early childhood attendance uh, means how many months they have been attending the early childhood centers. Multilingual uh, status means whether they're from multilingual or monolingual background. And the last dimension we need to consider is the home characteristics, it includes maternal education and family income. There are some studies has reported positive relationship between the maternal education and the family income uh, and the uh, child's language environments, their vocalization. So we may consider it's possibly that child will bring the vocalization patterns uh, to the child care center to uh, affect their uh, vocalization patterns when they interact with the educators in the center. So that's what we focus. In these studies, with all these variables, we would like to answer two research questions. The first is, are there any difference uh, in their language environments between the monolingual infant and multilingual infants, which will be represented by the number of educators' language inputs, uh, child vocalization, and the conversation terms. The second question we would like to know is, whether the, um, the above uh, variables we just mentioned before has any uh, impact on the relationship between the multilingual reason and their language environment, which means whether the variables will influence multilingual and monolingual infants language environments. So moving forward, I would like to share you some information about our participants. There are 181 infants in our studies. Their age range from 12 to 21 months old. We recruited them from 37 early child centers in Sydney, Australia. 87 female, 94 male. 80 are from multilingual backgrounds, 101 are monolingual. And they were from the 27 uh, language backgrounds for the multilingual infants. Next, I would like to share you uh, the descriptive uh, statistics of the early child language environments. So for these studies, we totally had uh, collect 1,104.7 hours totally radio uh, audio recordings. So average per trial is had 6.1 hours of audio recording. Let's take a look together at this table. As you can see, there's a great uh, variations uh, in all this number of adult workout, child vocalization, and conversation terms among these infants. So educators speak as little as only 145 words per hour. Uh, the measurement is 3,295. But tribalization it ranged from 14 to 419. For the conversation turns, it ranged from 0 to 149 turns. Now we got all the outcome of these language environments. 
um, how can we interpret the boundings? What did we find in this study? First, I would like to show you the uh, results regarding the quantity of the educator words. As you can see from this chart, uh, actually we found no significant difference um, in the quantity of educated words between the monolingual and multilingual infants. However, what matters is the infant gender. So we found that boys heard significantly less talk than girls from the educators. It would be uh, around 177.9 less words per hour. Regarding the conversation tense, uh, we didn't find any significant difference between monolingual and multilingual infants in their conversation terms, and also no significant factors predict the number of conversation terms. Now we jump to the quantity of the child vocalization. As you can see in this chart, the broken line shows that uh, multilingual reason did not significantly make any difference. Uh, for predicting the number of the child vocalization, which means uh, multilingual infants only slightly vocalize less than the monolingual uh, English only infants. But uh, the difference is not significant. I think it's around 19 words per hour. Look at here, I would like you to. Uh, have a look at the other three uh, variables, which is very important for these results, is the infant age and the current language environment scores and the group size. So for the infant age and language development and snapshot scores, we found they are positively related to the uh, number of the child vocalization, which means when the infant gets older, uh, they can vocalize more. This is inconsistent with the variable of their language environment. Uh, they got higher score in the snapshot uh, report by the parents. They vocalize more as well. However, for the group size, we found that infants in large groups, they tend to vocalize less than those in small groups. So what do you think, what could be the reason behind this? Before we moving forward, I would like to show you another two more interactional efforts regarding the child vocalization. The first one is the infant age. As we mentioned about the infant age, as they get older, they vocalize more. However, this trend, if you take a look at this chart, you can see it's, it's uh, mainly applied to the monolingual infants. So we barely can see this increase in multilingual infants group of children. The second interaction efforts I would like to show you is the, uh, the time they spend in early childhood centers, the relationship between uh, the months in childcare and the number of the child vocalization. As you can see from this chart, the uh, multilingual infants, the longer time they spend in early childhood centers, we can see there's an increase in their vocalization. However, this is not happening in monolingual infants. What can we tell from these studies? It's the longer time uh, we spend in the early childhood centers matters, especially for multilingual infants. If we further summarize and interpret the findings, uh, first, we found uh, there's no significant difference between the, uh, the multilingual infants and monolingual infants regarding the words they heard from the educators or the conversation terms. However, we found the boys receive significantly less educated tools compared with girls. We can think about any possible factors behind that. Uh, some studies has reported girls actually has earlier brain maturations, uh, which they can invite uh, caregivers, parents 
to provide more response during the interaction. And some other studies also found uh, teachers of older children, uh, they have closer relationship to girls compared with boys. So this may, maybe can be linked to our findings. And the other important findings um, is our study is the first to report uh, the negative relationship between the larger group size and the child vocalization. Uh, we can image in the early childhood classrooms, if the teacher, they are struggling uh, to interact in the large group size of children, uh, it will be very challenging for them to provide a very interactive style of interactions uh, with the children. In the last findings, we found all roads educators, they speak as the same as much to both monolingual and multilingual infants, but somehow multilingual infants did not vocalize more as monolingual infants. This may be remind us that um, to support multilingual infants, we may need some language support strategies to encourage them to vocalize it more. But the other positive news from these studies is we found the importance uh, of early childhood language environment for uh, multilingual infants. It could be uh, particularly beneficial for these multilingual infants' vocalization as well as they uh, spend a longer time in early childhood center. Uh, maybe at first they don't vocalize as much as because it, it's a new environment, new language for them to adapt. And once they got familiar with the environment, they get better in their vocalization. So we hope our, our findings of these studies will be able to help us to understand, help um, educators and parents uh, to work together to uh, understand what they experience, all these infants experience in early childhood centers and to further provide a high quality interactions um, opportunities and language environments for all the children, including multilingual and monolingual infants. So this is our findings regarding the quantity of the language environments. I will pass to Sheila to continue uh, sharing the findings regarding the quali quality of the language environments. Thank you. Okay, so, so back over to me now to take this story a little bit further. So what we heard from Fiona was the analysis that we have been conducting recently that's looked at the quantity of the words that infants and toddlers are experiencing during their everyday interactions with educators and the quantity of the vocalizations on the basis that that quantity does matter. However, as we've already heard, it's not only the quantity that matters, but also the quality of the interactions that take place. So in this study that I'm going to give you an overview of now, what we did was we looked at uh, centers where infants and toddlers experienced a lot of words from the educators as determined through the LENA technology. And also we, also, we then compared that with the conversations that were taking place in centers where they, these infants didn't hear nearly as many words. So I'm gonna take you through this study now. To start off with, let me just explain a little bit about why we wanted to focus on conversations. And it's all to do with this notion of collaboration and the collaborative construction of meaning. So Catherine Nelson explained that the infant constructs a beginning lexicon in collaboration with at least one other user of the language in shared activities where the two may interpret each other's collaborative intentions. So what this is highlighting is that it's not only important for infants and toddlers to hear and experience a lot of language, but they also need to have opportunities to use their developing vocalizations and their developing language skills in that to and fro conversation interaction so that they are able to have the opportunity to collaboratively construct with their educators new meanings 
and new ideas. So as I said, what we did in this analysis um, was that we used the LENA uh, uh, system again, and we recorded, we had about 60 children, and we recorded um, three hours of data using this system. And you can see here the kind of graphs and the kind of data that this system is then able to generate uh, in terms of the estimation, estimated counts of adult words and vocalizations and of the audio environment in its entirety. What we were interested in were the adult words, and this is the, uh, the data that we used as a springboard for this particular study. So the study that was a catalyst for this particular analysis was published back in 2018. And we were interested in infants experience with what we call this near and clear educator talk. And what we found in our analysis of about 60 children was that there was a huge difference, a bit like Fiona found, there was a huge difference in the number of words that these infants were hearing uh, during that kind of three hour time slot that we recorded. So you can see here there was a minimum of uh, about 343 uh, words a minute, right up to a maximum of over 3000 words a minute. That was the individual differences that we had in this study. And what we found was whilst there was an average of about 22 words a minute that these infants and toddlers were hearing, the lowest was only 5.7 words a minute, which is really not very many words at all. And you can see here uh, the nature of that individual difference when we um, split things into quartiles. So we were looking at quite pronounced differences and we were then curious about, well, does this have an implication? Is it just simply that some infants are hearing more and experiencing more words than others? Or does this have an implication for the quality of the interactions that are taking place? So what we did was we purposefully selected the seven infants who had the highest um, amount of experience with words and the seven from our sample that had the lowest experience with words. And we used these to contrast to see if there was a qualitative difference in the interactions. What we did, because as you can see from this graph, and this graph shows uh, how many words the child is experiencing every five minutes across the time. And what we actually did was we thought, well, we want to pick the peak time for these infants, because it might be that the children who are in what we call our low word count centers, it's possible that those children still had periods, you know, little peaks of really strong and rich language interactions. So from each of our children, we chose the top 15 minutes and we used then a very um, detailed analysis to pick up on the conversations that were taking place. And we coded those 15 minutes to find out and count how many conversations uh, that occurred. And we um, decided to code conversations that lasted for at least three turns. We chose three turn conversations because then that would include an initiation by either the educator or the child. Then the first partner would respond and then the initiator needed to respond back. So that three turn conversation enabled each person to respond to the other in that reciprocal way. And then we were interested in whether those particular conversations terminated at three turns or whether they continued on. So to start off with, from our question, did the conversations of infants who heard many words differ from those that heard only a few. Let's just look at the sheer quantity of conversations when we contrasted our high word count center with our low word count center. And here's the contrast. It was very pronounced, uh, the, the difference in quantity. So the children who were in these high word environments were hearing 
over twice as many, or were sorry, participating in over twice as many conversations as those from the low words, uh, the low word centres. But our question then was, okay, well, what about the qualitative difference of these conversations? Were the function of these conversations different depending on the centres that they were in? So we used a basic functional distinction to code our conversations. To start off with, we looked at the initiation and we coded it as either interpersonal or informational. So our interpersonal conversations were the ones that were very much the social oriented ones, and they often were revolving around these instrumental wants and needs of the child. So something like, do you want some peas? I want you to sit down now. Can I help you put your shoes on? All of these are around these kind of what's called often called goods and services um, kind of conversations. The second type of conversation though, the second type of in initiation could be informational. And this is where the person who was initiating the conversation was doing it um, purposefully to refer to something, what we're calling the referential language function to refer to something or to share information with the other person. So it might be something like, can you see the dog outside of the fence? I just heard a truck going by. Those kind of conversations which are in, about sharing information with the other person. So we coded our initiations as either instrumental or referential. And just comparing these two types, this is what we found. We actually found that there were more referential conversations across both centers than there were instrumental conversations. So this was good because this, these referential conversations are the ones that construct knowledge. They're the ones where uh, infants and toddlers are hearing information, conceptual information, and information about opinions and perspectives and so on. So these are the learning rich interactions. Then we ask, okay, well, we've got a number of these different conversations. Is there a difference depending on whether it started off as an instrumental conversation or a referential conversation in terms of whether or not that conversation terminated at three turns or whether it continued on? And as you can see here, there was quite a pronounced difference. So the instrumental conversations, nearly 60% of those terminated once they got to three turns. They were very short conversations. When you contrast that with the referential conversations, you'll see that actually over 60% of the referential conversations continued past three turns. So the referential conversations were giving these children more opportunities with sustained conversations um, that we all know are really important to support their learning. But what about the middle? What about the nature of the responses that happened? What about the response in uh, the first turn as well as the second turn? So we coded these as well. And we coded them in different ways. To start off with, a response could simply acknowledge or repeat the uh, some aspect of the initiation. So for example, if the educator said something like, would you like peas? An acknowledge or a repeat response would be the child would either say, yes, that's an acknowledgement, or would say peas to repeat that information. So this was about kind of little bits of information that were being added to the conversation, but not really connecting the dots between that information. Contrast that with our second way of coding the responses, which was uh, to code it as what we called either an elaborate or extend response. And these elaborate or extend responses were responses where more information was added and it, the conversation was therefore extended. The topic was extended over the terms. So to sum up, 
what we did, we ended up with four different types of conversations that we were uh, analysing and that we were also then contrasting with each other. So we had instrumental conversations that continued. We had instrumental conversations that terminated at three turns and the same with the referential conversations, referential that continued past three turns and referential that terminated at three turns. So the question now was, is there a difference in the middle? Is there a difference between uh, these conversations depending on what kind of responses happened in the sequence of this conversation? So what we did is we used a form of analysis called sequential analysis, which was purposefully designed to uncover patterns in, con or in conversations. And it, it, this type of analysis provides you with um, the probability that a particular response will happen uh, in response to a particular initiation and so on. So the best way to explain this is that it enabled us to look at these conversational chains to see if there were associations between the chains and see if there were differences between the chains. And the best way for me to show you the results is actually to show you this in graphic form. So here's our first kind of conversation. And this was the instrumental conversation that continued past three turns. And what you'll see here, if I use the pointer, is the blue for instrumental. Here is the green, meaning it continues. And these are the responses in the middle. Here's the first response here. And you will notice in this conversation, in this type of conversation, about 40% of the first response was this elaboration extension type. In the second response, it was the other way around. It was 60% became this elaboration extension type. So that's the kind of pattern that we looked at. And what this analysis showed us was that there was a significant difference between this pattern of conversation and then the pattern of conversation that was the instrumental terminate. And what you'll see here was with these conversations that were the really short ones, there were very, very few first responses that were the elaboration type. They tended to be the acknowledge and the feedback type. So hopefully you can see the significant difference that occurred between these two conversations. So let's now progress to the referential conversations. Hopefully the difference will be quite clear here as well. So here's our, our yellow, meaning that's the referential one. It continued. Look at the difference between that and the instrumental um, continue uh, graph. You'll see here that nearly 80% of the first responses were um, of this elaboration and extension type. And even when we look at the instrument, uh, sorry, the referential and terminate conversations, you will still see that we've got more elaboration and extension responses in that first conversational turn than we have definitely in the instrumental terminate, but also there's a significant difference between this pattern and the instrumental continue. So what we saw by doing this form of analysis was that the referential conversations did have differences in the middle when we compared those with the instrumental conversations. In particular, there was this importance of this elaborative extending conversational style that took place in the middle of the conversations uh, for those referential conversations and in particular for the ones that were more likely to continue. So quickly now, back to our initial conversations, uh, so back to our initial question, I should say. Did the conversation patterns of high and low word centers differ? So remembering these four different conversation patterns, you'll see here that there were significant differences between the conversations, the qualities of the conversations that took place in the high word count centers, which is the dark, bar on the graph and the low word count centers, which is the light 
bar on the graph. So to start off with, with our instrumental conversations, you will see here that children who were experiencing very few words in their sentence were experiencing significantly more instrumental conversations that terminated at three turns. The conversations they were having were around their wants and their needs, and they tended to be very short conversations. Compare that then with the referential conversations. You'll see that our children who were experiencing a lot of words during the course of their interactions were engaging in significantly more referential conversations overall, and in particular, more referential conversations that were likely to continue. So what we were seeing is that there was a relationship between the quantity of the words that children were experiencing and the quality of those interactions. So they were all part of the same package, that quantity and quality went hand in hand. So hopefully that'll give you a little bit of an insight. Again, it's drawing very much on statistical data. And now I'm gonna hand over to Natalie, who is going to give us more information about the quality of um, the educator talk and she's going to give you more of that qualitative data that was um, done in her study which is looking at how the talk can support children's learning. Mm -hmm. um, indeed uh, the study that Professor Degatardi has just presented looked at the statistics of um, infants and toddlers talk and the study I'm going to introduce examines toddler talk from a qualitative perspective. My name is Natalie Brandt. I'm a postdoc um, at Macquarie School of Education. I have been working with Professor Degatardi and Dr. Emilia Jonah for a few years while I was doing my PhD and now um, as their research fellow. It is my privilege to present a part of my PhD study that investigated uh, naturally occurring conversations between toddlers and their educators. Mm. For this study, I have invited um, 12 toddlers, uh, five girls and seven boys under the age of three. They attended four large centers in Sydney. The quality of all participating centers were rated as excellent. The educators had various teaching qualifications from certificates three and diploma uh, to university trained early childhood teachers. The child educator ratio in the room was one to seven. Um, I have filmed each child for five hours across two days. So each toddler had two sessions of continuous filming of two and a half hours during their normal day in the center, including the meal time and the care time. During the sessions, I asked the educators to do what they would normally do in the center. During the data collection, of course, I followed the ethic rules very strictly. Uh, to prepare the data set, I watched the, all the video footage and transcribed all conversations between the focus toddlers and their educators. Then I selected uh, conversations that had at least three turns and were not instrumental. By instrumental talk, I mean the behavior management and achieving any needs and wants. Uh, as it was evident from the previous study, uh, the instrumental conversations and very short conversations are not impossible, but very hard to um, use for um, uh, to determine how toddlers learn from the, uh, through the language. Uh, further, I coded all conversations according to my impressions um, of their purpose. This qualitative analysis uh, resulted in forming uh, categories of conversations. Then I looked at each conversation in each category to find what linguistic features they had and what learning opportunities they represented. One of the most interesting aspects of talk 
uh, that my supervisors and I managed to define was the topic of conversations and how it was related to the immediate activity of the participants. In one case, the topic was related to the here and now. In other case, it was not at all related to the immediate activity of the participants. And here are two examples that illustrate both cases. So we called one um, uh, type of talk grounded talk. And um, this is on the left hand side. And the talk that was not related to the context uh, was defined as free talk. So, for example, the educator and Sam are talking outside. Sam is holding a dinosaur toy. Educator, Sam, come and show me your dinosaur. How many legs has a dinosaur got? Show me his legs, Sam. Three. Educator, three? No. So these are the feet. Educator, one, two, three, four. And what's the dinosaur do? Sam, roar. Educator, roar. What color is your dinosaur? Sam, red. Educator, it's not red. What color is this? Sam, green. Educator, green. So as we can see, um, the child is playing with the dinosaur and he is talking about the dinosaur. The other type of conversation is when the topic is not at all related to the activity. Lucy and other toddlers are having lunch. Lucy, we have to be nice and we go to the party. Educator, are you going to the party? The party, big party. Lucy, no, that's party. Educator, a dance party? We like that. Lucy, no, that's party. Educator, that's party? Dad is having a party? Lucy, yeah. Educator, are children invited to the party? Lucy, yes. Educator, yeah, cool. Lucy, happy birthday to daddy. Educator, happy birthday to daddy. When is his birthday? When is daddy's birthday? Everybody usually has a birthday. It's up to us whether we celebrate it or not. As we can see, this conversation is about birthday, but the activity has nothing to do with the, with the birthday because um, the participants are having lunch. Um, in literature, the talk that is not grounded in here and now is usually defined as the contextualized talk. And it's relatively well researched in the preschool years between four and five. Also, the contextualized talk is well known in early childhood education and it's considered as an effective learning promoted strategy. Uh, our preliminary findings, however, show that the type of toddler educated talk that we established is similar to the contextualized talk, but not close enough so we can use the term. This is why we call this type of talk free talk. To explain the difference, I will demonstrate the example of the contextualized talk, but first I would like to summarize what we know about the contextualized talk and why it is important. Um, first of all, um, totally the contextualized talk is not particularly well researched, but toddlerhood is the period when this type of talk starts. We can suppose so because, as highlighted in the literature, the talk between babies and their caregivers would only make sense when highly supported by the clues from the context. Preschoolers, as research shows, can confidently engage in the contextualized talk. Um, this is why um, toddlerhood is when this type of talk emerges. Um, So this is an example of um, the contextualized talk. I took it from uh, the work of Macy, who, who talks about the contextualized talk in preschool years. Uh, this, these are the questions that educator can use during um, the shared reading. The first two questions are highly related to the pictures in the book. Where are the worms in the picture? What is the mother worm doing in the picture? So we can uh, uh, answer these questions by looking at the illustrations. 
the latter two questions take the topic a little bit away from the immediate context and this is why they are supposed to promote the contextualized talk why does the worm love it when the girls run off screaming so by this question the children are encouraged to to reason why do you think the worm never has to take a bath another open question that spring that is that extends the topic from the immediate context but still springboards from the illustration to explore the free talk in depth we have uh, defined four subcategories interview story inquiry and rebuttal and let us have a look at all of them one by one mm -hmm. So the first type of free talk is interview. Again, this the entire conversation is not related to the immediate activity of the participants. Owen is playing in the sand pit. Educator, hey Owen, who is in the big school in your family? Owen, Emma, educator. Emma is at big school, isn't she? Does Emma go to Oliver's school? Owen, no, educator, no. Owen, Mrs. Smith, educator, huh? Owen, Mrs. Smith. Educator, Mrs. Smith, have you met Mrs. Smith before? She's not very, oh, not very, educator, not very friendly. All right. And then you go home. What do you do with Emma? Oh, huh? educator, whenever, when Emma gets home from big school. Oh, ah, chocolate, educator, chocolate, chocolate. Yes, I thought so. Something food related. So in this talk, Children um, co-constructing stories about their personal experience. They have an opportunity to recall the events and experience from their social life and also follow the topic that is suggested by the educator. In this conversation, we can see closed questions such as Emma is a big school, isn't she? Different types of verbs such as action words and um, mental state words, for example, I thought so. Uh, also familiar names like Emma and direct address, they own. The next type of talk is story. Uh, Max is having lunch with other toddlers. The educator is at the table too, Max. I'm going on a Jetstar airplane, educator. Tell me again, Max, a Jetstar. Educator, a Jetstar airplane was it orange? Max, no, it was white. Educator, you went on a white Jetstar airplane. Where did you go? Max, Nana and Grant's house. Educator, hang on, troopers, finished. Where did you go? Max, I'm going to Nana's and Grant's house. Educator, you went to Nanny and Grant's house. Where do they live? Max, they live at Christmas. Educator, they live at Christmas? Max, hmm, educator. Hmm, I think I remember where you went. Did you go to Coffs Harbor? That's where they live, isn't it? The purpose of this conversation is sharing stories about toddler's personal experience. They co-construct a narrative together with the educator and connect their personal experience with the general knowledge. In this conversation, there, um, what's interesting is there is an initial statement of the toddler, I'm going on a Jetstar airplane, and the pardon statement of the educator. Tell me again. There is also a concluding thought. So this conversation continues and it, it ends with educators saying that everyone in the airplane has to wear a seatbelt, even a pilot. Um, also, this conversation features closed questions. For example, was it orange? The next type of the free talk is inquiry. Leo is asking his educator about an unfamiliar adult who he had previously seen in the room. Leo, is she your friend? Educator, she's my friend. Her name is Nina. Do you like Sharon? Yes, child. 
yes, educator. Then you like Nina too. She is nice. She is really nice friend. So in this conversation, toddlers are requesting information by asking questions to the educators. And they're using their language to seek information. And the final type of free talk is rebuttal. Um, Max, another toddler, and the educator are at the table. They are playing with a clay. Max doesn't seem happy with, after an encounter that he had with a toddler sitting next to him. Max starts talking about the, uh, with, the with the educator. Uh, Max. He did not use his words, educator. He did. He said, thank you. He said, thanks, Max. He has to say it louder, educator. Pardon, Max. He has to say it louder, educator. He should say it loud, Max. Yes, educator. Oh, that's okay. He was just saying thank you, Max. He can't say it loud. So the purpose of this um, talk is disagreement. Uh, and toddlers are learning to develop and express their opinion, which the educators are not always in agreement with. Uh, and the language features of this talk are negative statements and again, closed questions. Um, I summarized our knowledge about decontextualized talk and free talk in this table, uh, but by no means I want to contrast these two types of talk. Rather, I see Free talk is a precursor of the contextualized talk, but recognition of both types of talk deepen our understanding on how exactly everyday conversations contribute to toddler's learning. Next. Let's... Uh, mm. uh, so the main difference between uh, decontextualized talk and free talk is that in decontextualized talk, open questions are common and in free talk, closed questions are common. Constructing new knowledge is the purpose of decontextualized talk or its learning opportunity. Um, and free talk provides toddlers with um, such learning opportunities as sharing information about familiar events and offering information um, and offering information that they would like to share with the educator. And that is demonstrating the existing knowledge. Contributing um, into constructing new knowledge, uh, asking for information and inquiry, and proposing an alternative idea in rebuttal. Okay. Um, so let's see why free talk is important for practitioners. First of all, free talk is challenging. Um, um, as toddlers um, have to rely on their memory and language skills. Free talk provides uh, toddlers with learning opportunities to both demonstrate the existing knowledge and create new knowledge. And demonstrating knowledge for Toddlers is very important because as educators, we want to capitalize on that. Our free talk features closed questions, which tend to be undervalued, especially in toddler's talk. And free talk occurs in various daily activities uh, in the centers. And that tells us that everyday conversations may be as valuable for learning as the planned practices and literacy-oriented practices, such as shared reading. And I would like to conclude my part with thanks to the colleagues. And also I thank all the early childhood educators in the audience for doing one of the most important jobs, making sure our toddlers are amazing language users and confident learners. 
So just very briefly to summarize, uh, I hope that um, you can see the connections between these three studies that were presented by Fiona, by Sheila and by Natalie. So Fiona has taken us um, through considering uh, multilingual infants experiences in early childhood settings and specifically thinking about the interaction between the qualities of early childhood programs, for example, the group size, the length of uh, infants attendance at early childhood settings and also the language environment that they experience there. Um, in Sheila de Gutari's talk, we heard about the opportunities and value of extended conversations for enriching the language environment that infants experience in early childhood settings. And finally, in Natalie's presentation, uh, the focus was on the purpose, the language features and learning potential of free talk in toddler educators educator conversations and also why it's important to recognize that free talk even though it might not necessarily have all the features of um, decontextualized talk with preschoolers for example which um, you know is very well recognized and acknowledged as contributing to learning we think that uh, free talk as well contributes to learning in ways that are appropriate for toddlers so uh, these studies are also informing our work on two large longitudinal projects the first one is uh, MQ Talk. Talk stands for Talk, Learn and Know. And it looks at how the language and whether the language environment at infants and toddlers, children actually aged between uh, 12 to 18 months, the language environment they experienced in long day care, whether that environment then is reflected in their language outcomes, specifically their ability to use that more decontextualized language at age four. So this is, um, we're still going on with the main, um, the data collection at age four for these children. And also toddler talk, which I mentioned earlier, which is looking at toddlers, focusing on toddlers and the emergence of these features of decontextualized talk in children from when they are two and a half years old to three and a half years old. So we're looking at things like, you know, how they use questions, when and when they start to use model expressions that are useful for expressing possibilities. Uh, for example, uh, may, can, could, and so on. And uh, basically trying to understand how that learning oriented talk emerges and develops in toddlerhood. So thank you for your attention. I hope you've enjoyed the presentations. Thank you very much for that very rich uh, sharing. Um, I think uh, we have about 15 minutes for questions. Um, I'd like to request that the participants key in their questions into the chat box. Um, could you, I think that would be clearer and easier for the, uh, 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 the speakers to respond to you. Could you please do that? We'll pause for maybe two or three minutes for you to key in your questions, okay? Thank you. Maybe while waiting for the questions to be um, uh, keyed in, um, maybe I can seek a clarification on uh, Professor uh, Sheila's presentation. Um, this thing about High Word Center and um, the and the um, referential extension referential extension elaborative conversations, right? Um, there is is this is this uh 
correlational uh, 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 relationship between the high the high word center and um, the extension elaboration uh, uh, strategy, or are we saying that uh, it is a cause and effect? Um, I don't think it's a cause and effect. I think it's a correlation, mm -hmm. but um, partially uh, in some ways you might argue that there's a dynamic relationship between dynamic in the sense that uh, when she referred to the chains and I'm trying to get back to that yes <laughs> uh, so she talked about the sequential analysis and basically yes. she explained that depending on what the first move is and then what the second move is that each move creates the context for the subsequent move as we know interactions and conversations work for us all so in this sense then um well uh, you know you can't really describe that as a cause and effect but there is a probability relationship that is created there as well so yeah i think the answer to your question is and sheila might correct me if i'm wrong but i think it's correlational data but there's also some sense of you know the um one move creating the context for the next and making one more likely than another not causing it but yeah, making it more likely. Okay, thank you very much yeah, for that clarification. Yeah, um, there is one comment in the uh, chat box. This is coming from Nolija. Um, she says, hi, is there a correlation between educators? Oh, it's a question, sorry. Is there a correlation between the educator's qualification and frequency of instrumental referential conversations? Uh, well, it's a little bit difficult to know. I don't know what the exact results were and whether um, Professor de Gutardi's um, sort of team that worked on that particular part of the, uh, that particular study looked at that. But we know from quite, quite a lot of studies that there seems to be a relationship between the qualifications and the language that educators use with um, infants and toddlers. Uh, uh, one of the issues that might make this a little bit harder to study is that many of the educate, educators who work with infants and toddlers, at least in Australia, they are educators with, um, you know, the sort of shorter qualifications. So the certificate three and the diploma, which is certificate three is just six months and diploma is just one year. So I, I'm not quite sure to answer the question. I'm not quite sure whether they went further to look at that relationship, uh, but I think it's, that makes it a little bit trickier to, to look at compare these relationships because yeah there would be a lot more educators working with infants and toddlers who have the lower level qualifications okay yeah uh Nolija, has your question been responded to yes okay thank you natalie and fiona please feel free to um you know respond to questions yourself if you're more familiar with some of these are there other questions or comments? Does this square with our local experience? Does this square with the experience in Singapore? I was thinking when Fiona was um, presenting that in Singapore, perhaps that, um, you know, making such a neat distinction between um, infants from monolingual backgrounds and multilingual backgrounds would be impossible. Um, let's see. Children from, I think, I think the children from monolingual were getting more and more of such children in Singapore too, because generally, oh, okay. generally in our families, um, we're seeing this trend uh, happening. More and more families are using English at home. And so, you know, um, the children speak English before they even speak their mother tongue. Uh, so for many children, it's that way now. Um, so in a way, the monolingual homes that you talked about in Australia would be more or less like our English speaking homes um, in, in our setting. Whereas your multilingual uh, homes would be um, more like those who
will have more exposure to mother tongue languages at home. The dialect speaking, the Malay speaking, the Tamil speaking, or the Cantonese or, or you know, the Hokkien speaking families, right? Uh, because we have been, we have adopted um, English medium in our schools for about 40 years now. So, um, most of our parents actually speak English at home. Yeah. Oh, okay, so that's that's where <laughs> I think I need to be updated. Yeah, yeah, yeah. but of course, of course, there are uh, 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 many, many people who um, migrant families, right, to Singapore, and uh, we do we do have that uh, very rich uh, um, mix of different family backgrounds, right? But the Singaporean families, there are more and more of them who are speaking English at home. Yeah. And that's a trend across the different ethnic groups. Yeah. That's very interesting. And yeah. a bit worrying. <laughs> okay. Now, there are no further questions. I wonder if there are comments from people. Uh, there is uh, um, an instruction coming from the organizer. Uh, Kaisin is, is requesting uh, that all participants, could you please, um, if you'd like to recap our previous sessions, you can go into a certain link. She's provided information here. Kaisin, would you also want to put up the slide for them to give um, their, their feedback on the session? Where? Wait a minute. Okay. Okay, Jeridin, you want to you want to say what you have written? Gizek, you have written something there. Hi, Dr. Sam. Hi, everyone. Um, good afternoon from Singapore. I just wanted to thank the Macquarie team for very, very interesting studies and insightful presentation. My question and my curiosity. Is, is there a significant difference uh, in the implementation of free talk that uh, Natalie shared in terms of the teacher-child ratios? Because I understand in Australia, the toddler group ratios uh, change from one is to eight to now one is to five. Thank you very much. Okay, Natalie, would you like to respond to this? Yes, yeah, sure. Thank you so much for the question. Um, usually, um, the ratio is one to seven. The thing is, um, the aim of our research was uh, to determine this type of talk, but we are not looking at anything at all that is uh, promoting the talk or if um, any factors like uh, the qualification of the educators or the child educator ratio contribute to the um, quantity of the talk. Uh, yeah. Maybe that is, uh, of course, the venue for the future study. Yeah, that was a more qualitative study that Natalie completed. So it was actually looking at the nature of these different conversations. And, um, you know, if one of the sort of illuminating insights that we had from this study is that there is the potential for this type of learning oriented conversations in all sorts of activities and not just um, the pre-planned activities, but every, you know, um, routine activities, meal times and so on. The potential is there and we just need to recognize what it looks like with toddlers. Um, so it was a qualitative study, so it wouldn't, um, you know, it wouldn't be able to give us the um, answer to a more quantitative um, question, but it is an interesting question to look at, particularly with things changing, whether that uh, is reflected then in the quality of the conversation would be interesting to see. Thank you very much. Thank you for the Thank question. For that question. Are, there, are there other questions? If not, I do have a question for Fiona. Um, yes, sure. Yeah, in, in your study, you um, had home characteristics and maternal, maternal education as, fam as well as family income uh, were included, mm. right? And of course, you explained that this is associated with earlier studies, you know, that uh, these are two important uh, factors um, affecting home characteristics and, and how children uh, pick up language. 
But I wonder with more fathers being involved in parenting, you know, and interaction with uh, the children these days, whether um, paternal, you know, education uh, should be considered in similar studies in the future. And what's your experience, you know, um, in relation to um, parents, you know, fathers and mothers, education in your own studies and research and um, their effects on the children's development. Mm. Thank you so much, Professor Sham. This is a very interesting and important question when we are conducting the uh, studies. We do consider that and we do collect the data from uh, both parents. Um, but um, for some children, uh, because they come from a uh, single single mother's family so we couldn't be able to get the father's education but i think that is a very uh, important factor to consider because um, recently has a few articles reporting the uh, like how chatty the daddies will affect the child's vocalization in, in infant stage um, and yeah if the i think the father association is the uh the father's talk positively related to child's vocalizations. Um, I think in the future, yeah, if we have in uh, all the sufficient data, we will uh, also include that yeah, to look in there or how they affect their home language environment and whether it will affect the child's uh, the vocalization and the child will bring that to interact with the educators. Thank you very much. Yeah, I think that's a very, very important thing yes, yeah, we should consider. Thank you for that response. Yeah, I, I see Nuru's hand uh, up. Nuru, do you mean to ask a question? Nuru Shafika? Sorry, it was an accident, sorry. Oh, okay. <laughs> 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 okay, now it's almost time. Um, I, I wonder if anyone would like to say something or if uh, the speakers would like to, to say anything before we close the session. Amelia, you want to say anything before we, we close the session? I just wanted to add something that's interesting, but I'm not necessarily sure that it's immediately related to what we presented about. Uh, uh -huh. But your question, uh, Professor Sam, made me think about, uh, you know, the research of, uh, for example, one Australian researcher at Wollongong University, and I had to search up the name because I'm so horrible with names, Elizabeth uh -huh. Dorsma, and she's looked at the uh, children's language and literacy experiences with their fathers and uh, argued very strongly, but primarily focusing on preschool age children. And that's again, something that's a gap that our research is addressing. So on the one hand, she's looking primarily in the home environment and also focusing on preschool children, but arguing that, you know, um, both fathers and mothers provide very important and different types of interaction opportunities for children. The way in which they use language um, is different and so on. So it's a little bit removed from your question about um you know paternal education and maternal education uh, and also removed from our focus on early childhood settings but it, i thought it was kind of interesting that it um you know we need to think about uh yeah these factors more broadly right thank you very much thank you very much i think this has uh, the presentation was really really rich uh thank you very much you've given us a lot of information uh, to think about and for us to further deliberate on and in our learning about infants and, and toddlers. Thank you very much for coming in today, uh, speakers, you know, and participating in our public uh, talk series. And to the audience, thank you very much for your attendance today and thank you very much for uh, your participation as well. All the best. Thank you so much for the invitation. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you so Bye. much. Bye. Bye-bye.